This Week in Radio Tech, episode 257, is brought to you by Axia Audio and the Axia Radius Networked IP Audio Console. Throw your budget a curve and meet Radius by the Telos HX1 and HX2 telephone hybrids, the most advanced hybrids ever developed for use with analog phone lines, and by Lavo and the Crystal Clear Virtual Radio Console. Crystal Clear is the radio console with a multi-touch touchscreen interface. How do you push meaningful metadata to 34 FM and HD transmitter sites across a large state radio network? <laughs> We're gathering data input from statewide news bureaus, websites, and live programs too? Then add in EAS data for each coverage area. Well, Steve Johnston joins us to talk about how Wisconsin Public Radio is doing all this and more. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host. So glad to be here. It's our 257th episode. And Twert is the show where we talk about radio technology, broadcasting, audio, RF, everything from the microphone to the light bulb at the top of the tower and streaming and everything in between. I'm glad you joined us for this show. If you would, stay tuned for the whole show and tell your friends about This Week in Radio Tech. And by the way, if you're tuning into the show live, thank you, but you can also subscribe to the show. Use your favorite pod-catching software, whatever that may be, and subscribe to This Week in Radio Tech. There are instructions on the website. You can catch those instructions at uh, gfqnetwork.com. Just click on any of our episodes, and you'll see the, the directions for subscribing. Uh, you can do the same thing at thisweekinradiotech.com. Our show is brought to you by uh, the folks at Axia, also the folks at Telos, and the folks at Lavo. We'll be telling you more about those uh, guys as we uh, go through the show today. Hey, let's bring in uh, from Manhattan a beautiful day in New York City. It's the best-dressed engineer in radio, Chris Tobin. And once again, you Hello, did Chris. disappoint. Hey, Chris, you did not disappoint. Wearing a jacket today. Yes. Well, I have to actually, I'm going to a, a gala, a, a volunteer gala this evening across town for the first book. Uh, they're, they're folks who uh, get books for communities and schools that don't have access to a lot of uh, literature. Uh, folks like Scribner and uh, Penguin Books. Disney helped that along. So I'm off to that this evening, right after our broadcast, actually. And I guess I'm in an undisclosed public location in somewhere in Manhattan. There are plenty of squirrels, pigeons, and some other interesting livestock running around the place. But we're good. Are there any transmitters? You know, sometimes you come to us from a place where there's transmitters. Sadly, the only transmitters are in my bag for ham radio, <laughs> and I think there's two Parks Department law enforcement folks talking on their two-way radio. So that's the transmitters I have at the moment. <laughs> are they talking about you? Not yet, but they are looking in my direction, so we'll see how things go. Okay. Just tell me with the network. Uh, maybe that'll work. Chris Tobin, yeah. always, uh, <laughs> yeah. Chris Tobin, always here to uh, add uh, great commentary. Uh, you know, he's he's my right hand man in doing this show, and he's been here for just about every one of the 257 episodes. All right, we got a guest uh, this week. Let's go ahead and bring him on in. Steve Johnston, the uh, director of engineering and operations at Wisconsin Public Radio. Hey, Steve, how are you? Glad you're here. How's it here. going? I'm sure glad to be here. Thanks. Yeah, glad you're here. And and Steve, I don't I don't know if you and I ever met before uh, this past NAB, or actually I should say the the Public Radio Engineering Conference. Had we met before that? Oh, probably just in passing. Maybe so. Maybe at, maybe at the Telos booth or something. Well, uh, I was uh, I was very flattered to be part of the Public Radio Engineering Conference. They asked me to uh, be on a panel about IP audio. So I was on this panel with some other uh, luminaries in, in the IP audio world. And while I was uh, waiting to be on that panel, I got to sit in for a couple of uh, sessions at the Public Radio Engineering Conference. And one of those sessions was a, uh, a presentation delivered by our guest, Steve Johnson. And I, I was so impressed with this presentation, I thought, we've got to have Steve on the show and kind of explain this um, maybe all over again, or at least have a conversation about the technology that, that uh, Steve, that you were describing here. And uh, I don't know, but Chris Tobin, were you in the room during Steve's uh, presentation? Mute. Mute. I did not, I did not make it to the PRC um, conference, no. Okay, okay, yeah. I can through his paper, no. Gotcha. Okay. Well, then, then uh, you'll learn something, and I'll get a refresher on what Steve had uh, talked about. But I'll tell you what, before we get started with that, and I want you to stay tuned for what Steve has to talk about, it's pretty amazing what Steve did to get some different vendors to come together and create 
a solution for disseminating emergency and perhaps other information across uh, the vast network they have of 34 radio stations and three networks uh, covering uh, the state of Wisconsin. So uh, it's really amazing what Steve put together, and I'm sure he... I guess he had some help, so we're going to find out about that coming up in just a few minutes. Our show, This Week in Radio Tech, is brought to you in part by my friends at Axia, and specifically brought to you by the little console that could. It's the Axia Radius. This is an eight-fader console. Uh, It is expandable if you want to, but generally it's sold as an eight-fader console. And in fact, listening to this show right now, our audio is going through an Axia Radius console. And that console is actually automatically producing a mix minus audio feed for each of the participants. I'm getting a custom feed right out of this console. So is Chris Tobin, and so is Steve Johnston. We're all hearing the other people, plus you know the show, if Andrew Zarian wants to come into the show or play some audio, we'll hear that, but we don't hear ourselves back through Skype because that would be really confusing. That would be this terrible, long echo, and it, it would just be awful. That's just one of the things that the Axia Radius console can do. In fact, all the Axia consoles create a mix minus for every single channel uh, every channel that can have a back feed. Now, you wouldn't send a mix minus uh, back to a computer uh, or to a CD player, but you would send a back feed to an in-studio guest, for example. You would send that guest uh, probably a, a mix of everything, but you could give an individual IFB. That is, you could interrupt that channel to tell the guest something. Um, you can have uh, hybrids, uh, codecs, like we're using codecs here for Skype. Um, so each, each participant gets their own back feed, their own mix minus feed. And it's very flexible. If Andrew Zarian, who's producing the show, wanted to move my fader to my channel, my audio, to a different fader, guess what? The mix minus would follow automatically. It's just amazing the way this works in all Axia consoles. And the little uh, eight fader radius console makes it affordable and very, very convenient. Now, speaking of radius consoles, um, I've got a couple of these consoles myself at our radio stations in American Samoa. I installed these things almost three years ago now, and uh, they are doing just great. They're on the air on uh, WVUV, uh, the farthest west W call letters on the planet. Also, uh, KKHJ, our little 93KHJ station. Uh, that we have in American Samoa. And we also have the little brother of the, uh, little sister <laughs> of the uh, Radius console, the RAC, the RAQ, RAC console in our newsroom in American Samoa. And of all things, just yesterday, here in Nashville, where I live, I was, I was very, uh, very blessed to take a tour of the RFD TV facilities here in Nashville. They built some new facilities uh, where uh, GAC, Great American Country, used to be on Music Row here in Nashville. And I'm walking through this facility, getting the tour, and we walk into the studios that are used by Rural Radio. That's a 24-hour radio network that feeds a Sirius XM uh, satellite network. And uh, bam, right there in the master control console for Rural Radio is an Axia Radius console. I had no idea that they had it. And uh, it's just a gr- beautiful installation. In the main room, they have a, an Axia Element console. So great consoles, easy to hook up, audio over IP with live wire, and uh, you add an X node to it, you got a live wire plus, which means it's compatible with uh, Ravenna and with AES67. Uh, give the folks, uh, if you're in the U.S., uh, you may want to check this out through Broadcasters General Store. Uh, they are the dealer for Axia in the U.S. And most every country in the world has an Axia dealer. So check out the website. You can go to axiaaudio.com, and that'll that'll redirect you to the telosalliance.com website, and you can go to Axia from there. Check out the little Radius console. It's very affordable, easy peasy to install and make it work great. Thanks, Axia, for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. All right, let's jump right in now. Steve Johnston. Steve, you uh, did the uh, paper, a presentation at uh, the PREC about uh, consolidating information from various sources and then disseminating that. And kind of take walk me through uh, through what you're talking about here. Well, over the past three years or so, I guess, Wisconsin Public Radio has really expanded our efforts to use RDS, the data display on radios, as well as the program-associated data, sometimes called PSD, for HD radio displays. 
And we've been using that for both static information like call letters and slogans and things like that, as well as uh, using it for dynamic information about the program segment that's playing right at that time. And that can be challenging uh, with our kind of formats. Public radio has a wide variety of program sources and, and shows coming in. So uh, that's challenging. But it came together pretty well. And so once that was working, I started to think, what's the next step? You know, we had to disseminate this first to our local stations here around the headquarters in Madison to test it. And then we just deployed it to all the stations around the state. But what was next in terms of the information and something that I'd heard for years, I bet 20 years I've been hearing in the business that, oh, we could send emergency alerts by RDS and, and later by HD uh, pad data. Yep. And uh, But I wasn't aware of anyone who had actually ever done it. We all said it. <laughs> every conference yeah. there was a talk about it. But nobody had actually done it. I thought, well, I could see if I, see if this is possible. Okay, okay. Now let me see if I understand a, a couple of things. You know, most most radio stations, especially commercial stations, they use RDS. Um, you know, for as you said, call letters, slogan, maybe title and artist. If you get fancy and you've got you know some mechanism to get dynamic uh, title and artist information there. Um, and then, of course, there's HD radio. How many? You've got 34 stations. Are all or most of them transmitting HD as well? I think uh, roughly two thirds now had been converted to run HD, and that's both AM and FM stations. We've got a few AMs, mostly FMs, and uh, but we're we're taking it to another level. Even just setting aside the emergency alert information, we mm -hmm. provide information on who's the host of the talk show, for example, that's on the air. Or, and the name of the guest, and what is the topic of the show. And we repurpose that same information for our website, and also later it goes into the archive so that you have something you can search on. The uh, uh, music programming is actually some of the hardest. Uh, the mm -hmm. network providers of classical music and other formats, jazz and things that are popular on, on public radio, do not seem too inclined to provide these data streams, so we end up having to write a little software to steal it off their websites and... Uh, get it into the system that way. But our own shows that are handcrafted from, you know, a host sitting at a console with CD players, those are the hardest of all because they're doing it on the fly. It's a human involved. And uh, we're just now on the cutting uh, point to uh, to cut over to a system where that, uh, based on the uh, music log, will they'll be able to say, I have started this piece and, and let the data flow at the same time. Let me, if I could, uh, back back up just a second. Then we'll then we'll recover to to what you're talking about now because I've I've definitely got some questions. Uh, we, some of the viewers and listeners of the podcast are not necessarily full time in the broadcast, and uh, I know you know it's it's very possible to to be in radio and not really be aware of RDS or as we I guess call it in the U.S. R R B D S, um, and and th this is the you know the 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 text slow speed text that can go along with your radio programming and it's not too expensive or difficult to transmit um, static text like your call letters um, uh, it's a bit more involved to uh, to transmit dynamic text like title and artist and as you mentioned program host or other programming information so we have RDS that's part of FM FM broadcasting and then we have the the pad, or as you said, the PSD data that can uh, go along with HD radio. And HD radio, oftentimes you've got a radio that has a much more sophisticated display. Uh, it might be color, and it's got more room for for text. There's a lot of specifics that I don't know about that. How much you know text room that you have? How often you can update this? When you can put in graphics or or not? But I want to point out that you know for decades and decades, and you know I, I guess really for a century. Uh, broadcasters have been concerned, radio broadcasters, have been concerned with audio, and there's been no infrastructure for this data, this program-associated data, PAD. And so we've kind of, you know, had this little side chain going or built them where we needed them. Often start, it started out being serial data coming out of an automation system and then going directly uh, into uh, uh, an, an RDS encoder. Um, and then we got some middleware involved. We got some software involved that would um, uh, massage this data, if you will, uh, that it would put it into maybe a better looking format for the RDS and maybe at the same time give you another output uh, for HD radio, uh, you know, for the PSD there. So 
uh, and this is a, a an area that, hey, as an engineer, I've been in the business for, what, 35 years now, and I just recently had my first experience in putting uh, this kind of data on our web stream, and I have yet to go put it, uh, put dynamic data on our uh, on our RDS on on my radio stations. Uh, I guess we're doing it in, in Samoa. We have been doing that for a few years, but uh, at our stations in Greenville. So this is kind of new to uh, to a lot of folks, and it's the it's almost the kind of project that you get into it, you do it once, especially you program your call letters, your format, and that kind of stuff into your RDS encoder, and then you kind of forget about it. And yet, Steve, you're taking you've taken this on to be a very active thing, and I'll bet you it it requires you know some consistent uh, updating and input as you take on new programs. And here I am just yapping too much. Why don't I I'll let you describe uh, a bit more about um, you know th creating infrastructure that hadn't been there before to to grab this data. Go ahead. Well, you have to think you have to think about the inputs and the outputs. Where are you going? Where are you going to get this information? In a lot of cases. You might have it already in an automation system, like if you're playing music from your automation system, it's bound to be able to send out the uh, title and artist information that you've already entered into the, the database, the library, if you will. Yeah. But that's the most simple way. And I wish we, we can't, I couldn't even do that in our operation. It's not, we just don't do it that way. We've got a music library of 10,000 uh, CDs and none of that hardly has been digitized at all. There was a breakthrough that really made this sort of large-scale work possible, and that was uh, maybe twofold. One was widespread interest in, in doing online work with our website. Once people had to enter information about their shows for that purpose, it wasn't too hard to repurpose it to use it in our uh, program-associated data stream for the radio stations oh, okay. so that it, it would be displayed on the radio. So my goal was that people would at least only have to enter it once. And if they're and and part of the selling point, I think, was to convince. Uh, and admittedly, a lot of the folks uh, who were doing this were younger people, more entry level positions. They were more excited about being on the web, having their information on the web, than they were the radio displays. And uh, I just I just kept my mouth shut <laughs> and let them do their thing because I could repurpose that data very effectively. The other piece of the breakthrough that made this really possible was we went to a uh, interconnection around the state of, uh, of uh, a wide area network, uh, IP mm, protocol. Mm. And once we did that to move linear audio around as audio over IP, um, using point-to-point uh, -point links, in some cases multicast and so on, that's a whole other complicated thing that uh, mostly was done by our partner agency here in the state uh, known as the Educational Communications Board. Um, once we had that infrastructure in place for the audio, I realized, well, now I've got a lot of stuff I can do as far as remote access and maintaining computers at a distance over that network, and I can send this data to all the stations. So having all the transmitter sites uh, connected via IP, wow, yeah. that opened up uh, incredible possibilities. You, you, you did that, obviously, because, well, IP is the, the, you know, the technology uh, of of the, of the decade or the century, de jour, uh, yeah, yeah, de, de, de many jours. Uh, so you said you can send audio that way, and you said you're sending linear audio to the transmitter sites, but th but obviously IP lets you send almost any kind of data. Uh, that's in, right, in, including this this robotics data. I mean, robotics. That's right. Sorry, this this RDS data. That's right. And um, text is tiny, tiny little bit of data. There's yeah, just yeah. Uh, it's a drop in this otherwise full stream. And we actually have a TV network that also uses some of the same infrastructure. Their signals are the, are the largest. Their bandwidth occupation is, is gigantic. This text is nothing at all. And I would emphasize, though, that this idea of interconnection uh, made so many things possible. Now I can do two-way linear links between our bureaus around the state where we have studios and offices in different cities do those links between studios, back to headquarters. We can have talk show guests in another city. And that those links are up 24 hours a day. It's not you don't have to establish an ISDN or a, a connection using a, 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 you know, a connection over the Internet. This is a private wide area network that we can take advantage of. But in it, and it is used actually for emergency alerting here in Wisconsin because the National Weather Service contracts with uh, our partners uh, at ECB to provide maintenance and interconnection for the for the National Weather Service transmitter. So we have a, a big part to play in, in emergency alerting in the state. We form the backbone of distributing 
emergency alerts from both the uh, state emergency management and National Weather Service. So that's, you know, ways that messages get to individual stations for EAS. But then the, the problem I faced in this particular little scenario where I want to put emergency alerts through our pad system and have it appear on the front of a radio while the person is hearing the alert or shortly thereafter, mm -hmm. um, the, the key to that or the, the breakthrough really was, in fact, to have this interconnection, to be able to send the data in a timely fashion. Organizing it is a whole other problem. You mentioned at one point middleware. Yeah. And uh, this idea of organizing, and, and we uh, certainly had to embrace that. We have a, a multi-level organization of that. We have a, a sorting system that I, I tend to call it, uh, and it's actually provided by a company called Arctic Palm. That's the one we settled on. It's their center stage live product. There are others, though, that, that do similar work. And uh, this system then takes all these various inputs from uh, entries from a, that have appeared on a website, maybe, entries that were typed by somebody, Entries from an automation system, maybe from a satellite delivered program, and brings all these things together and decides which network it applies to, where is it going, which stations need to get it. Then on a regional level, we also do some sorting because we have regional shows, just to complicate things, that only appear on a subset of our stations. Uh, yeah. So they want their data. And so it gets very complicated fast. But I knew once we had learned enough with the, uh, these other messages – Emergency alerting wasn't too much further down the road. One complication, though, is, is that it's geographically based. The emergency alerts, the EAS system, as a matter of fact, is entirely based on geography. And I thought, how will, how will I handle that? I said to myself, finally, well, I don't have to because if I take the emergency alert information from the EAS uh, encoder-decoder for that particular station and route it through the system, it's automatically the right data for that station. And those listeners. I want to find out more about that, but also I want you to take us through the story in just a minute about um, how you identified what you needed, what I call the middleware to do, and then how you work. You mentioned Arctic Palm as, as the vendor, so let's let's pick on them or, or praise them as, as we go along and and see how that development process worked. But I want to I want to see if uh, Chris Tobin can swing into the conversation here for a minute. Chris, I, I'm I've you know I'm smiling from ear to ear, delighted to hear um, Steve talk about what you can do with IP. <laughs> this is this is thrills my heart to know that he's doing audio and data, and you know he can put cameras and phones and backup drives and all kinds of things at, at transmitter sites and run that all through the same IP pipe. And isn't that what you're involved in quite a bit? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I've been talking about for years, actually. And, uh, you know, Steve and many others have taken advantage of it and realized what you can do. It takes planning, as he pointed out, and it's something that you just take time with. And if you do it correctly the first time, uh, you shouldn't have any issues coming back to expand or evolve it. If you don't do it right the first time, yes, you have spent a lot of time trying to catch up and fix things, and it just gets messy after that. From from what you've heard so far, Chris, from what Steve's described, um, can you think of, of uh, well, and we'll ask Steve, but uh, what if you were thinking about a statewide network, private WAN, and, and, and distributing some you know, audio, he said that some was um, uh, unicast and some was multicast, if I understood him right. Chris, what would be some of your questions and concerns about setting up this kind of thing that could be a little complicated uh, depending on, on how you want to handle it and, and what you wanted to, to disseminate. Well, I would ask the question of how was it implementing the wide area network portion? So you know, if you're doing multicasting, I'm assuming using layer two switches or layer three and two, and then, you know, the, inf the, the as you put it, the, the pipeline around the, the state, it, is that, you know, have diverg uh, divergent paths? Is it set up in such a way that there's a... Um, you know, failover capability or, or some type of continuity planning. So once you build out this network and you've got everything going on, you've got your bureaus, you've got your other stations, what was the disaster recovery approach or, or, you know, I guess built into it? Yeah, okay. All right. So we'll uh, – uh, Steve, let's um, – yeah, I, I want to hear the story about developing the, the, the needs of the software – uh, and and you know what different things that you're ingesting and, and how decisions decisions are made. Uh, let's get to that after the next break. So for right now, Steve, give us a little bit of a hardware overview of of the the network. How are you getting stuff physically into this WAN, and and then how does it appear out at uh, transmitter sites? Well, uh, 
the idea of uh, reliability and, and emergencies is vital just for normal service to the listeners, putting aside any emergency alerting. Um, so that was very important. Uh, we have uh, three levels of redundancy on the wide area network, and then we have a, a fourth level, uh, which doesn't use that network at all. Uh, the different levels are uh, mainly in terms of uh, what we expected from the vendors, as to you know how they if they had multiple paths to deliver our our uh, data, and uh, if they were able to use the kind of switches and routers that were necessary to create this this wide area network. In you know, it's not on the internet. It's all within uh, private circuits. If we didn't have the resources of an infrastructure of the university system, it would be more difficult and more expensive. No question. Mm -hmm. But uh, that also means that if we're getting a bargain in a sense, you sometimes get what you pay for. <laughs> so you don't want to, them to cheap out or or not pay any attention to your your needs. So that was critical. I wasn't too closely involved with that. Like I say, the uh, our partner agency, that uh, the other half of Wisconsin Public Radio, one half being the university system and the other half being a state agency, um, the other half, uh, just by hist the historical arrangement, uh, has the primary duty to worry about interconnection. But I certainly know the story. Uh, the redundancy then in terms of the hardware, we have uh, encoders provided uh, by a, a company called Barracks, and uh, they've proved uh, pretty reliable and pretty well suited to the challenge. I have other makes and models that I've used for other things and do have them on the same network. But our primary method is to uh, to use these barracks encoders, uh, model 500 and 1000 in some cases. They uh, have, We have a set of them that originate the networks here in Madison at our headquarters. Uh, we have another set of them that picks up a uh, set of uh, the same program lines at uh, the agency's offices in another part of the city. And then we have encoders at uh, two of our bureaus in Milwaukee and La Crosse, which we had designated long before as uh, our continuance of operations uh, locations for our two main networks, the News and Classical and then the Talk Network, which is known as the Ideas Network. So we've got those levels and the receiving devices that are receiving the, the uh, multicast transmissions of the network. So we've got one device feeding multiple receivers around the state at our bureaus, at transmitter sites. They are programmed to automatically, if they lose the feed from the from the main unit here at my place, the headquarters, they fall over to the uh, to the backup set that's at the other building. And indeed, then uh, should that go away, then they look they're programmed to look to the uh, continuance of operations locations. If the whole network were down, we have uh, silent sensors that detect that situation, and uh, we'll then go over to a backup that is an over the air relay using. Uh, the uh, hidden uh, signals that ride on our HD television transmitters around the state. Oh, okay. So we have another delivery mechanism. Now that would bypass all our regional inserts and data and stuff. It would just be the raw programming, the yeah. audio programming. But that comes in very handy when the <laughs> when the poop is hitting the fan. Yeah, yeah, that's really smart to embed. So you've embedded the stereo program um, material in the statewide HD public television network. Is that That's what I right. They have, they have their version of multicast channels uh, mm -hmm. that uh, allow you them to have, oh, I suppose, uh, second language programming and things like that. Yeah. And, uh, and you can make those so that they're not tunable on an ordinary receiver. You can have them, in a sense, private. Um, and that's uh, the way these are. works out pretty handy as a way. Now, if there's still things that could totally take you down, no, no question. Um, in that case, I've got plans which are more manual in nature to rebuild the network using interconnections um, of a more primitive sort, I guess. <laughs> okay. Hey, uh, if, if you're tuning in, you're watching This Week in Radio Tech. It's our 257th episode. Steve Johnston, the uh, Director of Engineering and Operations at Wisconsin Public Radio, is our guest. And also with us uh, from a beautiful park in, in Manhattan, New York, uh, Chris Tobin is along with us for the ride and uh, listening in and, and chiming in from time to time. Our show brought to you in part by the Telos Alliance and the Telos HX1 and HX2 telephone hybrids. Now, you've known Telos for 30 years now for telephone hybrids. It was 30 years ago that Steve Church uh, introduced, and actually probably 31 years or so, uh, that, that we've been selling uh, uh, hybrids, uh, digital telephone hybrids. So they connect to an analog POTS phone line, 
uh, most of the models do, and uh, uh, digitize that audio. And then uh, using DSP technology, really do a fabulous job of separating the send and the receive audio. And then using now Omnia audio processing really processes that caller audio so that it's very listenable, very consistent. Uh, from caller to caller. The levels are consistent. The EQ uh, sounds consistent from caller to caller. And the send audio from your microphone, you, you know, your, your radio station, to the caller is also processed so that it sounds good and it's less likely to feed back in any kind of an open mic, open speaker situation. The HX1 and HX2 hybrids represent real workhorses and they're like fifth generation now of the, the hybrid technology that goes inside these. The HX1 and HX2 have got dip switches that you can set up for any country in the world for, you know, they can do all kinds of things about the POTS line, like the loop current, the ringing cadence, uh, you know, the the current with uh, with the, with the the set you know on hook so to speak uh, or, or off hook. Um, they also have built in uh, auto answer, so no longer is auto answer on your hybrid an option. It's built in to the Telus HX1 and HX2. Now, what's the difference? The HX1 is a single phone line telephone hybrid, and the HX2 is a dual phone line telephone hybrid. Something else cool about the HX2: if you want to use the HX2 as as your talk show system, maybe a two-line talk show system, well, the HX2 can actually conference its two hybrids together. And that way, you can provide just one mix minus from your audio console into the HX2. So let's say you've got an older audio console or maybe even, you know, a very a very inexpensive mixing console like a, a Behringer or a, Hi or, or a, a Mackie uh, a console. You can provide just one mix minus out of that console and feed both phone lines and the, the HX2 will conference the two phone lines together so the callers hear each other and they hear the talent who is on the air. Uh, again, they'll auto answer and auto hang up, so they're great to use in, say, a television operation where you need auto answer hybrids for the remote uh, trucks, the remote uh, reporters to call in on uh, and get their IFB information right there. So these are awesome hybrids. Uh, you see them in, in news stations all over the place. You see them in production rooms all over the place. And uh, if you want a hybrid that works and works well, by the way, you can plug it into you know to your business phone system with a with a, a POTS adapter on your business phone system, like for a fax line, and they'll work great uh, in that situation too. Uh, automatic EQ, Omnia processing. The HX1 and HX2 are just incredibly good values, and they sound great. Uh, in fact, I heard one on the air just uh, just yesterday at uh, at RFD TV. Um, check it out. The website is telosalliance.com. Click on uh, Telos and click on the uh, the hybrids right there. Thanks to Telos for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. All right, uh, Chris Tobin is with us uh, from a park in Manhattan. He looks very comfortable. And also uh, Steve Johnston is our guest, the Director of Engineering and Operations at Wisconsin Public Radio. So we're talking now, we're going to get to the meat and potatoes about this um, uh, ability to gather uh, programming information, textual programming information, and assemble that, figure out what's important and what's not, and then send it out to various transmitter sites all over the state of Wisconsin for encoding into their RDS or HD radio streams so it appears on listeners' radios. Steve, where would you like to take us next in this story? Well, I mentioned uh, these that we have these different sources of, of text data. It might be people entering it manually, might be something coming from an automated system, might be picking it up from a website. And one of the coolest examples of that is uh, the uh, Arctic Palm uh, Center Stage software does have the ability to uh, sort of scrape data off of websites, including the National Weather Service. So it's a cinch to uh, have mm -hmm. weather information appear on the da radio display. That's actually been a feature that many listeners have commented on. Um, our, we have a whole department for interacting with the listeners because they're also often members of uh, public radio. And uh, so we get a lot more feedback than might otherwise be the case. I know that was uh, hard for me when I was in commercial radio. I didn't get that much contact with the listeners. So I hear from listeners, and the one thing that I think has stood out as something they were excited about was seeing a weather forecast appear there. And it's uh -huh. just the, the bare bones of information, what the high is, what the low is going to be, and, uh, and the basics of like mostly cloudy you know, it has to be short. As you pointed out, 
The RDS displays are very limited in terms of their uh, number of characters. I think uh, in many cases, the radio actually is, uh, e the display on the radio is even smaller than what the specification limits are, which is, I think, 64 characters. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the HD has more data bandwidth. It still doesn't take much, but there was not much in RDS. And in fact, uh, there is more room to display. But you also have the problem of, of you want to have a message that's short and concise so that people can see it easily in a glance. And that would be true of this emergency alerting information. I felt it was important to keep it very short. Um, as we'll probably discuss, uh, you know, you're going to get a lot of detail from the EAS uh, messaging. But we really just want the basics. We want to know, for example, it's a tornado warning. And we want to know the time period involved. I started to go down the road of saying where is the uh, time and, and the location, and I realized, no, the station's coverage area is already defining the geography. If we're using the right emergency alerting information, the, only the messages for that coverage area are going to be available. So I didn't need that. Didn't need the time either. I decided to put the message in rotation in our sorting system for the duration of the alert. So if the tornado warning, taking that example, would last for two hours, that message will be in rotation among our various other slogans and program information and weather forecasts for the next two hours. So help me understand some, some of the routing here. Let's say you've got, and I uh, uh, hope I get a name of a town right here, Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. Is that a town that you cover? We don't have a station there. <laughs> okay. Sorry. No, no, I'm I the one, the one market. We've, oh, yeah, we've got stations everywhere, unfortunately, okay. for me. Um, so, so well, no, you, you would and, have, and, and there's a, there's an emergency weather. There's a, a tornado uh, watch for some area. How do you pick that up? Where does it go? And and where does it come? You know, how does it get back out the transmitter? Certainly, the emergency alert device, the the Sage in our case, uh, NDEC, uh, the encoder decoder, might be located at our bureau in that region, or it might uh -huh. be at the transmitter site. Either way is okay. Um, I did learn in the process of this work though that. The Sage devices were not ready to send this data out their their uh, Ethernet port. That would have been ideal if that could be done. But in fact, what I ended up having to do, and part of big part of my paper was describing this idea of taking the serial output from the Sage encoder decoder, and instead turning that into or putting it through a tunnel on the Ethernet, and uh, so that it sort of provides a virtual serial path across. It could be across the whole state, but we usually don't want it for that, for the emergency alerting. It's going to a fairly nearby point where we have the computers that do the sorting of the uh, program-associated data for that region. So, example, that you're describing a station that serves Fond du Lac, it has an EAS device that's already programmed to only react to messages for that area. Right. And that, there's, messages, there's the filter. There's the regional. Right. I mean, the the, you, the, you, the the coverage area filter right there. That's right. And so if you accept that point, you can then use the CenterSage software to, uh, to catch that data, to be the receiver for that transmission, a serial transmission over Ethernet. It seems kind of uh, paradoxical, but the device to do it is a cinch. I mean, it's a $100 project for each one of those. And the, uh, the devices are readily available online. I, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the, uh, the manufacturer of the device we used, Lantastic oh, or something like Lan that. Lantronics. Landtronics, that's right. Yeah, and uh, I bought them from I think Grid Connect was the uh, vendor online. Oh, by the way, here's a and, here's a piece of trivia for you. One of the brains behind Landtronics and their development of their products some years ago, uh, doing exactly what you say, serial to Ethernet conversion. That same person is one of the brains behind another product you mentioned, Barracks, the Barracks oh. codex that you're using. I can see parallels in the in the <laughs> thinking there, definitely. Yeah. And in fact, I only needed one device. You would think you would need two of these devices to turn it back into serial at oh, the uh, yeah. server end. But in fact, you can just run a virtual COM port on that, on that computer, where the, the same computer where the center stage software is running, and catch okay. that data. The, the software doesn't know it isn't a real serial port. It's actually uh -huh. coming in as packets on Ethernet. It works like a charm. And, uh, and you mentioned something, and I should emphasize this point. So far, this has been a fairly trouble-free system. You'd think it would be breaking every time you didn't look at it. But in fact, it has been very stable. It had every chance of going wrong because I, if nobody's done this before, that's a strike one. Strike two is it's running in the back room. It's not <laughs> running in front of your face, so you're going to forget uh -huh. about it in the uh -huh. heat of battle. 
but so far it has not inappropriately crashed or, or done anything strange. Um, it keeps a log of all its activity so I can check periodically and see what kind of traffic. But you program, uh, continuing our example of uh, the Fond du Lac station, you have uh, this uh, already defined amount of data coming out of the serial port of the Sage end deck. It's just the basics of the alert, and it also includes a number, just one, two, or three, that defines the severity of it. Is it a real alert, like a threat to property and, and life, or is it just a warning, or I'm sorry, a watch, you know, something, something might happen, or is it a test? So those are the three levels. Well, we chose, at least so far, we've chose only to do real alerts. We don't send anything out on RDS or HD pad for tests or watches. So we're just doing the alerts, but that filtering occurs uh, easily based on just a single digit, a single byte, one, two, mm. or three there in, in that message. The center stage software then decides, okay, now I've, got, I've caught this data. Uh, which station is it meant for? So it has to know that, uh, you know, based on which port it's come in on, what call letter station it's going to be driving it to. And uh, there's multiple modules in the software that are, are handling different functions, different pieces, and it would vary with uh, your sources of information. The one that's used for EAS uh, work is actually a modified version of their weather module. So it works, it works great. The, uh, then from that point, we talk about that, it goes out as um, packets on the Ethernet network, this wide area network, and uh, they are addressed to the EAS, nope, sorry, the RDS or the HD exciter device that uh, is the destination. It's just addressed by IP, but it has to be in the right format for that device. We use Innovonix uh, encoders for RDS primarily. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a mix of vendors for the HD, whoever had the lowest price, I suppose. Yeah. The uh, formatting, though, is you know, the options are there. So there's a lot of details to configuring it. But once you do it, it's done and it stays done. Now, now fill in a blank on a, that I'm having on, on how this works out. At, at each transmitter site, I take it you've got, you've got some software running there that does scheduling and sorting of the of the messages coming to that to that individual site programming you know what who's on the air title and artist information if that's important uh then you've got weather you may have other announcements that run in in rotation on rds is that handled at each transmitter site no that's generally handled at one of the bureaus that serves oh. that region so okay we have these six bureau offices where we have a you know a server room and we have some studios and so on so it, there was you know, computer support there, uh, at least uh, mechanically. So that was a place to place it. So I'm envisioning in this example you're providing, uh, the Fond du Lac station, you have to pull the HD, I'm sorry, you have to pull the EAS data back to the bureau over the network, sort it, encode it, send it back to the, uh, to the transmitter site so it can get to the, uh, the RDS generator or the uh, HD exciter. It wouldn't have to be done that way. It's just the way that we're, we've arranged things. If we placed a computer at each site, that would work, and you might not need to do the tunneling. You could just do real serial then. However, now we've got a lot more locations, 34 of them, in fact, with these computers at, you know, it might be more of a support problem. So we decided to make it more centralized and also buy yeah, fewer instances yeah. of the software. Uh, some stations are driven in parallel so that, you know, one audio stream and one data stream will serve them both pretty effectively. Mm -hmm. Maybe just a little customization. So at these bureaus, we're doing our program choices. We have uh, different times of the day a station might do a regional show instead of taking our network. It might uh, uh, periodically through each hour, it's going to run some underwriting messages, which would be the equivalent of a commercial spot break. And uh, those are generated in this same bureau setting from a... Uh, Automation computer, we use the Audio Vault system, but of course, it could be any of the vendors. Gotcha. Okay. You had, uh, you had some pictures and graphics in, in your presentation at PREC, and that helped me to visualize this. But yeah. to, uh, if, if I recall from that presentation, you've got this uh, Arctic Palm Center Stage software running in the center of everything in, at, at your headquarters in Madison, right? And then you That's have it correct. running at the different bureaus, and, and those are what 
uh, uh, I guess, are the final decision makers as to what feeds. That's feeds right. Transmit? For each okay. individual station. So the one in headqu- at headquarters is deciding what goes out on each network stream of data, just like we decide what audio goes out on that network. Ah. Okay. And then in the regions, it decides, do I just pass that along or are they doing a different show right now? And in which case I can substitute at least the static information about the name of that regional show. I might not have dynamic data. It depends a little bit on the staffing that's available for those shows as to whether there's someone available to do that kind of data entry. Might not always be the case. Um, so it's, it's sort of this multi-level idea for us. But once you built that system, I thought there's no reason not to try to run the emergency alerting through it as well. Uh, it's a big project, but once you've built it, you start to see other ways you can use it. So you say you said it's a big project. Was it big in terms of the scope of just figuring out what was important and how you wanted to get it done? What um, uh, big in terms of dollar cost for for hardware? I, I take it that that wasn't that that wasn't so, so big a cost. No, I don't think that was the case at all. Um, uh, Most of our FMs already had RDS generators. Mm -hmm. I think uh, in some cases, though, they weren't ready to accept a uh, practical way of putting dynamic information in. In other words, you could program them with call signs and frequencies and whatever network of stations they belong to. You know, the usual RDS configuration stuff, but you didn't, they didn't have a port on them to accept uh, outside data. And uh, so those had to be replaced. I think I ended up buying about 12, maybe a dozen or so uh, Innovotics generators to help standardize our, our fleet. And uh, But uh, we had uh, quite a few. I've tended to buy them with new transmitter installations just as a matter of course. The HD system, uh, once you have an HD exciter, uh, there's different generations of those. And so I'm sort of avoiding the usual uh, terminology and just calling it the exciter, the generator of yeah. the HD signal. Um, yeah. Once you have that, you're ready already to to do the data. It's uh, just a connection across the uh, network. So that was easy. That was already bought. Um, in fact, uh, when I first tried this emergency alerting idea, well, actually, as well as all the other stuff, I did it in Madison first because it's convenient. I mean, the server room's down the hall from my office. So it makes it a lot easier to play with it. The remote access is simpler, and in fact, the stations, if it's not acting right, I can go out and reset the generator or whatever. The uh, deployment at two other stations is more complicated. It involves the assistance of our field engineering teams, which are mainly from the other agency. So I'm not the boss of them. (laughs) So (laughs) it has to be a cooperative effort between these different teams, and I was really impressed with how this went over. Um, I think as we started the discussion... There's a tendency for some people to uh, sort of uh, say, well, that's cool, but I don't really care about this text over radio stuff. Um, I didn't encounter any of that at all. People were very into it. And I think the driving force was that it wasn't going to be just static information. It was going to be Uh, dynamic information uh, that was actively about the show that was happening at that moment. Um, I still have some some wishes, I suppose. I wish uh, National Public Radio, which, of course, is the number one provider for uh, public radio stations, I wish they did provide real dynamic information about their shows. They still don't. Um, their satellite delivery system, which is known as Content Depot, uh, does indeed have that capability, but they're not generating the data um, mm. at, the, at the source. Uh, they do for their website. So I'm, I've made the case several times that they might easily automatically repurpose that information. Uh, sometimes you have to be con- conscious of writing short sentence so they can fit into the uh, available yeah. field. Yeah. But uh, metadata to go along with audio and video is increasingly important. Um, we've tried to build archiving capability here so we can reuse content in the years to come and also you know, find old content when we want it. And it's all about the metadata, having that information that describes this piece of uh, audio or video is is very important. And if you've made it for RDS and and HD, you've made it for the web, you've made it for the file storage, once and done. When when you archive an audio show, and I think most any engineer listening or watching this podcast would understand how to do that, but how do you also archive the metadata that that went out about that show? Uh, There's two ways, and I tried to do them both. Um, One way is to actually place it in the header of the file. And on a WAV file, uh, that's not not a cinch because the original linear WAV 
format didn't include any space for metadata, but there is the uh, thing that was popular in the uh, broadcast circles, what do you think, 10 years ago, called cart chunk? Yeah, yeah, cart chunk. <laughs> and uh, that cart chunk idea provides a space for the metadata. And so that information can be stored with the file. And I try to make that happen. It's not always a cinch. Um, it depends a little bit on the software involved as to whether it's ready to write that kind of file. Uh, wow. MP3 files, if you're saving files uh, in a compressed form, I think all the compression algorithms provide space for metadata. So, mm -hmm. for example, yeah. if you're on a Windows computer and you do a listing of your audio on your computer, um, those uh, MP3 files can have additional fields right there in the Windows Explorer that show you the metadata that's in that file. Not so for the WAV file because it was from an earlier generation. Yeah. Yeah, sure. If you but use the, iTunes or or other things, you'll you can you can you know more info or get info on the file and, and that's you can, right. There, there's there's at least in iTunes and uh, maybe this is uh, common that's across all. Exactly. Yeah, you can see a, a lot of things like that. So I lo I want to bundle it with the file because then at least you've always got the data. It's not yeah. uh, lost, but it's much more powerful if you have it in a database where you can do more elaborate reports and searching. So you got to have that flow happening, and. Most any modern website that has a content management system is working from a, a back-end database. So I'm thinking in many cases it can be handled uh, using the, the same tools, the same infrastructure that your website uses uh, for archival purpose. We've been saving audio files to our website since the mid-90s wow. here at Wisconsin wow. Public Radio. So we've built up quite a collection. Unfortunately, a lot of them were in a highly compressed form, the original few years uh, because uh, people were on dial up, you know, and stuff sure. like that. So <laughs> yeah. there was no sense to have uh, big files. They couldn't, they couldn't even download them. But that means that that material was saved in a, in a lossy format. And uh, sure. I, we, we converted them to MP3s, but uh, that only makes it worse as far as the sound quality. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, the, are are uh, these files, in, these files in real audio format per chance? They were was, indeed. Yes. So oh, wow. if you go to our website, WPR.org, you can see a, a rather extensive library that you can search, and, and uh, it's uh, a collection. I'm also working on archiving audio files in linear form uh, for our production purposes so that we have an archive of both old material. So we're digitizing old material, old shows, as we can. It depends on staffing and resources, and those are a little skimpy right at the moment. We had a flurry of activity and some grants that made that uh, more active a couple years past. And uh, material that's at the historical societies, the museums, the libraries. Um, WHA, our flagship station, started broadcasting in 1917. Wow. And so we've got a rich history here. And it has been pretty well preserved. So there's a lot of, a lot of interesting material. Uh, some of the best uh, are... Uh, tape recordings and, and acetate discs that we have in uh, storage that uh, are from kids' shows of the uh, 40s and 50s that were meant for uh, students, you know, little kids, grade school kids. to uh, They would listen to the radio and shows like Let's Draw and Let's Sing so that these uh, rural schools could have uh, arts uh, programs by radio. Pretty cool stuff. Wow. Wow. Stuff from the 40s. and you get, So WHA went on the air in 1917. Wow. Yeah. In the pre-World War I period, there was, it was a radio club, I guess you could say, of, in uh -huh. the science department. But they had a license. It, the call sign was 9XM. It was an experimental license. And uh, it was a sort of a hybrid between a broadcaster and a, and a ham station, which was true for hams in that period in yeah. general. And uh, But the reason that uh, I feel pretty confident to say that uh, it was a matter of broadcasting at that point is that at noontime, the station would come on initially with Morse code transmission and later with both Morse code and voice oh, um, wow. with uh, farm market reports, uh, weather forecasts, things like that, that people around the state would, would write down and post in their post office on a bulletin board. And uh, so that was broadcasting by my definition. It's meant for anybody who can hear it, and uh, it's meant to be, you know, of, of use to the public. Um, but uh, early days, a lot of cool stuff going on. Wow. We are, unfortunately, almost out of time. We're going to take a quick break. You are 
listening or watching This Week in Radio Tech, the weekly podcast where we talk about audio technology and as it applies to radio, radio broadcasting, and uh, sometimes we talk about RF and transmitters and towers and things like that, streaming, uh, websites, and, and uh, just taking care of audio entertainment uh, and information. We're talking to Steve Johnston. He is the Director of Engineering and Operations at Wisconsin Public Radio. Uh, Chris Tobin is with us. He's been awfully quiet, but he's in a beautiful park. He may have even fallen asleep amongst the pigeons there in the I don't think so. No, you haven't fallen asleep? Okay. No, the squirrels are running about. People are sitting on the benches, park benches, and uh, enjoying some sandwiches, and they are snuggling up with the the squirrels. It's been interesting watching people <laughs> scream. <laughs> Has anybody come uh, talk to you yet about uh, your microphone and laptop? I did have one park uh, ranger just walk by, look at me, nod his head, and continue on. So I'm, uh, I'm okay at the moment. <laughs> it is New York, after all. They've seen it all. <laughs> oh, yeah. They have, Trust me. Careful, I could sit here in an, in, a, in an armored suit and nobody would question it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, <laughs> you, you should put a hat out in front of you and maybe people would toss you money. Probably. I mean, you're, you are performing. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I could take a TARDIS and put it out here, and people would have fun with it. <laughs> hey, uh, we've got to do a quick uh, a commercial break, and uh, Chris Tobin and Steve, when we come back, um, you know what? I, th I think we probably ought to end the show on a tip, a tip of the week. Or, you know, if there's something interesting that you did this past week or, or you're about to do, let us know about that. But we're going to wrap the show up in just a couple of minutes uh, with uh, some information, you know, whatever is titillating that you'd like to pass along to uh, to our listeners and viewers. Our show is brought to you in part by our friends at Lavo, L-A-W-O, pronounced Lavo. They make some audio consoles. You know, they, they've been famous for making great, big, huge audio consoles. Uh, but Lavo has a line of smaller consoles as well. That It's their radio line. And one of those consoles is the Crystal Clear console. Now, we've been talking about that console for about a year here on This Week in Radio Tech, and if it, it has a really interesting concept. Now, first of all, it's like a, a number of other consoles on the market nowadays where you have a rack mount uh, DSP mixing engine. You plug your audio inputs and outputs into that DSP engine. Uh, it's available over Ethernet, so you can remote control it. You can set it up uh, with a browser. Um, uh, and you can also uh, do audio over IP through that Ethernet connection. In this case, with the Lavo system, you can do Ravenna uh, and uh, AES67. Well, the Crystal Clear console has another interesting aspect to it, and that is that you can operate the console, move the faders up and down, uh, hit the buttons, turn channels on and off, do options, do panning, uh, you know, set up mic levels and that kind of thing, you can do that with a multi-touch touchscreen monitor. So your console is is virtual. It's like put your hands right there on the on the screen and move the faders up and down. That's how it works. Yeah, I dreamed about that 20 years ago, and now the technology is here to make that happen. So Lavo takes a multi-touch touchscreen monitor with a Windows PC built in to the back of it, uh, and they put an app on there, and this app is. Uh, you know, gives you the GUI, the graphical user interface, to be the console. And if you want to move several faders up and down at the same time, push a button, uh, push several buttons at the same time, it's a 10-touch monitor. So you can touch 10. I, I don't think I can operate 10 fingers at the same time. I could do two or maybe three at the same time, and that's what the console lets you do. That's what the Lavo Crystal Clear lets you do. Now, of course, like any modern console. It's got a couple of program buses, a record bus, a telephone bus. Uh, it's got preview for any any source. Uh, it's got automatic uh, uh, mix minus going on. So it's got back feeds for, uh, you know, for feeding remote talent, codecs and hybrids and so forth. Uh, it has a couple of built-in uh, mic preamps. If you want more mic preamps, you can supply those separately uh, outboard and plug the resulting audio into the analog inputs on the console. Uh, it's got AES inputs and outputs on it. It's got some uh, uh, um, uh, GPIO, you know, for tally lights and uh, speaker or other kind of muting, any kind of function that you need to do around the studio with uh, with a relay. You can do that with this console as well. Hey, it's got uh, redundant power supplies available too. So 
Check it out if you, this kind of console is intriguing to you at lavo, L A W O dot com. They have uh, representation in the United States and Canada, um, and uh, so, and in many countries around the world too. Uh, Lavo is a big organization with uh, a lot of uh, sales representatives and technical representation all around the world. Lavo, L A W O dot com. Thank you very much, Lavo, for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. All right, let's uh, see if we can uh, hit up uh, Chris Tobin for some kind of a tip or exciting thing this week. What would you like to leave with us, Chris? Sure. This week's tip, um, let me see if I get this right. I actually was helping someone today, a uh, film critic, who's going to be doing uh, some reports for a radio station out of Cannes, and he's going to use RecordPad, which is a sound recorder for your uh, iPhone. And the reason we went with that was because he was concerned with too many attachments to his MacBook trying to you know, record interviews and do stuff. So he's going to use a uh, nice microphone adapter into the uh, iPhone, and then using RecordPad and an FTP site that we've set up, he will record his stuff and then send it to the FTP side from the phone and then off it goes and I thought it was pretty cool and for this gentleman who's going to be running around he, he told me what his days are going to be like it, this made the best sense for a workflow and form factor rather than trying to use a MacBook yeah. I've, I've heard of record patch you can record on it and then when you're finished with the file it automatically FTPs it where you want to go well, it gives you a choice you can set up I think to do an automatic or but it gives you a choice of email FTP and one or other options yeah um, would he use an external mic with his iPhone or the mic that's in the well, iPhone? Yeah, I told him he had two options. When he's at the hotel room, if he can get the microphone, plug it in, and go with it, that'd be great. Use a uh, blanket over his head to keep the room noise down to a minimum. Or if he had no choice to go with the, the hand, the microphone in the phone, try to hold the phone in such a way that it puts the sound source and the microphone and the phone close to each other, or at least in the right direction. So we did a few yeah. tests today, and it, it seemed to work out really well. Nice, nice. And uh, yeah, that's so. That's Record Pad. That's a an app that's in the uh, in the App Store. Yes, yes, it's free. And uh, I've talked to a couple of friends of mine who do reporting, freelance reporting, and they've used it, and it does work very well. I mean, there's some limitations, but I guess if you want to get crazy with editing, but just for a quick, you know, quick chats, get interviews going, get them in the can, so to speak, and then off to to your your destination, seems to be fast and, and real easy. Cool. All right. Thanks, Chris. Record pad. Steve, how about you? Do you have a tip or something you'd like to leave us with before we go? I do indeed. I do indeed. I'd like to uh, mention that I have a couple job openings. <laughs> oh, wow. We've never had that kind of tip before. Tell us about it. I do. I do. I have a position for a broadcast automation specialist. So it's somebody on my team who concentrates on taking care of our computerized automation and uh, playout systems. And that's a really cool job. And also have a very uh, conventional position uh, opening up shortly for your regular broadcast engineer, what you think of as a guy who can, you know, work on system level stuff as well as down to the component level. And, and uh, both of these are uh, full-time serious positions and uh, working with some very cool stuff here at Wisconsin Public Radio. If uh, people are interested in uh, applying for those jobs, was there a website? WPR.org, and you can uh, choose the careers tab and uh, have a look all right wpr.org and careers and that's where you'd put your information in for an automation specialist and a run-of-the-mill spectacular engineer for wisconsin public radio cool that wasn't a good way to put it was it not, they're <laughs> not ordinary <laughs> no not ordinary at all uh yeah all right. Well, thank you so much, guys, for uh, for being with us. Uh, Chris Tobin, uh, you do, as we mentioned during the show, you, you, you're kind of good at this IP stuff. Folks can reach you. Tell you what, you got a noisy microphone. Let's put the camera on to Chris, and I'll tell him where to go. <laughs> Support at ipcodex.com. If you send an email to that address, you'll reach that guy right there who's panning his camera around, and he's about to go raise money for kids' books. I mean, what finer individual could you find on the planet to help you with your broadcast facility? Uh, AM, FM, TV, Internet, uh, Chris Tobin's got you covered at support at ipcodex.com. Chris, thanks for being with us. Appreciate you. You're welcome. And, by the way, the park is Madison Square Park in uh, lower Manhattan. Ah, okay. Well, have, have fun at your gala event. I Watch take out. Thank the you. Group, That's the first book. The groupies are coming. Uh, the groupies are coming. That's right. why I wait until the conclusion of the show. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And, Steve, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for taking time out of your day and uh, getting set up a couple days ago with this. And I really appreciate it, and thanks for the expertise you've passed along. 
Oh, it's certainly enjoyable, and uh, thanks for doing a great job with it. All right. And also thanks to Andrew Zarian and to Suncast, co-producers on this episode of This Week in Radio Tech. Uh, be sure you, you, uh, you patronize our sponsors. Uh, check them out. Uh, go to their websites and uh, you know, give them a call and all that because they do make the show possible. We really couldn't do it without their help and without the help of the GFQ Network. Check out the other fine podcasts. Uh, at uh, gfqnetwork.com. Thanks a lot, everybody. We'll be back next week with another episode of This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye.